Peace, everybody. So in Detroit, we say, what up, though? What up, though? All right. So welcome to Detroit if you aren't from Detroit. And um, hello, family, if you are from Detroit. Um, or as I see Knox over to my right, where we are on indigenous territory, <clears throat> sitting on Anishinaabe land, stolen land. Uh, but Detroiters and indigenous folks here are trying to coexist and make a more humane society. You'll hear more from Knox during this conference. Um, so uh, my name is Tawana, I also go by Honeycomb. And as Katie uh, indicated, I serve as the Director of Data Justice Programming for Detroit Community Technology Project, which affords me an opportunity to always be thinking about equitable practices when it comes to data, digital information, and technology. Within equitable practices, um, I'm able to have an analysis around surveillance not making us safe, security not making us safe. The mindset that security creates safety is a conflation that has harmed a lot of people. As an example, um, if you look at police departments all across the city as well as the state and the world, um, public safety has been co-opted as a sort of language for more uh, militarized tools and technologies to criminalize communities. That is not to target individual officers, it's just a particular mindset that has been conflated. So anytime a community is trying to uh, be safe, they tend to invest in surveillance, they tend to invest in weapons, they tend to invest in things like drones and different militarized technologies. And so through my research over the last several years, um, I co-led a research project called Our Data Bodies Project, which looked at communities in three different cities, and some of the questions we asked them around how they experience their data and information um, came up with a theme across all three cities in Charlotte, LA, and North Carolina. Community members consistently said that they wanted to be seen, not watched. They felt like they were being surveilled. They felt like they were being targeted. They felt like the smallest things that they had done in their lives had then defined how they were able to exist within systems. And so they also said that they didn't feel that technologies that were being created in their neighborhoods were making them feel safe. So through that research, we then went on to create what's called a digital defense playbook, which allowed community members to then have exercises and workshops within their neighborhoods to create opportunities for safety. So they got to imagine what it actually meant to be in a safe neighborhood and most often it did not entail surveillance. It did not entail more policing. It did not entail surveillance cameras. It entailed knowing who your neighbors were. It entailed having resources. It entailed adequate public education. It entailed having affordable water and these sorts of things. And so moving into that vein, as that research project ended, um, Project Greenlight was coming into Detroit. Project Greenlight being uh, a system which, how many of you have seen a lot of green flashing lights? Have you been around the city and you've seen green flashing lights? So those are these surveillance cameras that are uh, watched 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week by Detroit police in their real-time crime center. So they have these screens where they're able to monitor all across the city where these cameras exist. So having just come off the end of research where community members are saying, we want to be seen, we don't want to be surveilled. We want to be seen, we don't want to be watched. Um, and then having cameras ramp up from nine initially to over 570 in the city, I had a visceral response to that. So I've, I'd already been listening to community say, this doesn't make me feel safe. And so lead, that leads to today in actively resisting Project Greenlight and actively resisting facial recognition technology because we've already heard from the community that these are not tools that create safety, they create paranoia. And as some of my comrades in LA would say, we'd like to shift from paranoia to power. And through power, we create alternatives to surveillance, which then ultimately creates safety. So I'll leave it there, but I left you all some magazines out here. Um, 
Riverwise Magazine. I also co-founded a magazine um, through the Bog Center, which is called Riverwise Magazine. There's a whole edition back there that talks more about Project Greenlight. Has an interview with one of our expert panelists, Eric, that's sitting two seats uh, to my left. And um, you can read more about Project Greenlight and you can read about the things that actually create safety in the community. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Marie Bröckling. I'm uh, a journalist at a non-profit uh, news platform based in Berlin in Germany. And I report, among others, I regularly report on security laws in Germany and a lot on um, how state surveillance technology is used in Germany. So like the equivalent of what Project Greenlight, from my understanding, is in Detroit. We also have similar projects going on in Berlin. So. That's like one of my um, main topics. And I would like, or when I, when I was invited to this panel, I thought I would like to introduce one term that I find to be really interesting and really telling and where the whole discussion on state surveillance is in Germany right now. And that term is the term of a dangerous individual or sometimes also translated as a dangerous suspect. And so this term, came up in Germany or like in lawmaking processes in Germany in the early 2000s, right after 9-11 event took place and like the whole discussion on where um, terrorist threats are also in Europe and also in Germany was at a like all time high. Um, and what is meant by this term or what it, um, what it is, is there is a person who has not been, who has not taken a criminal action yet, but who by police or other security agencies is considered to be willing to do so and capable of doing so. So it is a prediction that is made upon an individual. And this term to me captures, really does capture like some of the like core elements of where the surveillance discussion is going right now, at least in, um, in where I come from. So for one, under the group of dangerous individuals, I mean, to make a prediction, you need some kind of legitimacy or like some, you need to justify where this prediction is made upon. Um, and in the past, I think when there were individuals or groups who were considered to be dangerous, this was often backed by biology or sometimes medical scientists. And we have a really dark history of those, like those sciences supporting state power. And to me, what I see now, the dangerous individual is really backed by data analysis. So data analysis or the people who work in this field have become the new science to kind of like back those policies by the state. And um, this I find really interesting also because data analysis is often considered like most other sciences, but it's mostly considered to be neutral in a way. And Obviously, it is not because those softwares, those prediction or data analysis softwares are designed by people and they always have a bias and there's always a certain aim you're taking on who you want to who you want to capture with this and it's often used against marginalized or minorities also um, also in Germany. And another aspect to the term of the dangerous individual I find really interesting is the consequences you take from this prediction. I think this is really what you were talking about, Tavana, is because in Germany when you have those predictions, there have now been laws passed that allow police to either deport people, so people who don't have a European passport are or can be deported based upon such prediction on their future behavior. Um, and people who do have a European passport and therefore cannot be deported from Germany, they can be put in detention. So there have been prisons set up that are specifically designed for people who have neither committed a crime, so they're not under investigation or they're not in trial, and um, but they're just under detention for being potentially dangerous. And you can be kept in detention depending on which state in Germany you're from for several weeks or even months. So to me, this is really telling on where surveillance is getting because it's only, it's really not preventing crime from happening. It's largely just suppressing it or maybe pushing it away, pushing it to other places, but it's really not. And I think this is really where I can like, where I feel you, Tawana, is like, we need to talk about different ways on how to prevent it at, 
at its root causes. And so surveillance really isn't the way to go and putting people in detention centers or just deporting them is not a way to, to like prevent crime from happening or is not a way to like take to the root causes of such crime. So I'm really excited to be here. I'm really curious to hear all about like what you, what you are doing and the educational backgrounds you take and where you are taking this discussion. So, uh, hi, my name is Eric Williams, and I'm an attorney with an organization called the Detroit Justice Center. And like Tawana, a lot of uh, how we look at this is based on our vision of the future, and specifically for the Detroit Justice Center, our vision of a just city. What does it look like? And I think the one thing everybody agrees upon is that a just city does not include massive government surveillance, right? Uh, and putting that in place kind of undermines any other efforts you might have toward reaching that goal. Um, people often talk about how poorer and blacker communities lack investment, but that's not actually accurate. There's a lot of investment. There is investment in police officers, and police stations, and police cars, and cameras and real-time surveillance systems and then judges and probation officers and the jails themselves. There's millions of dollars worth of investment made in communities that doesn't actually, as you say, make us safer. Facial recognition technology is particularly problematic and in Detroit they keep trying to split it up, the surveillance from the use of this particular technology, right? But you can't divorce the two. But it's particularly problematic in Detroit, not just because of the high error rate for people with darker complexions, which makes absolutely no sense in a city that's 80% um, black. If you said, well, it has, this is going to really have a high uh, error rate for people who are white, the response would just simply be, oh, this isn't ready for use yet, and we wouldn't even be having this discussion, right? Um, because it's black people where the error rate occurs. It's like, oh, well, I'm sure we can come up with some safeguards to make it work, uh, which just goes to show you how this conversation revolves around controlling and dehumanizing the people that are being watched. It's particularly problematic, though, because this is an instance where the technology has moved so much faster than the law. Right. The rights of people just to sort of go about their daily business without the government saying, oh, you know, you there are suspect. Uh, that's a really underrated right, the right to anonymity. And we don't have laws in place yet to take into account artificial intelligence, facial recognition technology, and HD cameras on every street corner. It took a while for the law to even catch up to the fact that your phone is more than just a communications device and the police seizing that and searching it is something more than simply the police taking like your day planner or pulling a payphone out of your hand, right? So we haven't caught up there yet. And until the law catches up and creates some concrete or at least firmer barriers protecting our rights, we are really at the mercy of the police. In Detroit right now, the parameters for our civil liberties have been established by the police and basically there is nothing standing between Detroit and the most horrific of dystopian futures. Uh, nothing standing between us except a pinky promise from the police that they won't do it. But once you put in place a surveillance infrastructure, right, the cameras, the software behind it, it will be used. There is nothing in the history of humankind to make us believe that if you give the police the power to surveil closely large groups of people, that they won't do it. There's just no reason to believe that. It's insane, it's insane to believe otherwise. And in a city that's known for union activism, in a city that is known for civil rights activism in a city with a very large Muslim population, with a very large um, 
you know, undocumented population and immigrant population in general, the notion <laughs> of allowing the government to view and identify masses of people with very little effort is, is it's, it's frightening. Um, so it's good to see we've got activists everywhere who come at this from a, lar from a lot of different angles, right? There's not w one lens through which to view this. But from a legal perspective, we have to realize that if we allow this infrastructure to be put in place before we've created parameters for its use, we are looking at something that's going to be worse than COINTELPRO, it's going to be worse than what NYPD did in the aftermath of 9-11. We're going to be confronting, particularly given our current federal government, uh, given how Trump calls everybody a, a traitor and a spy, we're gonna be looking at the possibility of Americans being, uh, being watched, arrested, persecuted, for things that should be uh, part of their part of their civil rights. So. Hi everyone, I'm Janice. I'm the director of the Equitable Internet Initiative, which is a program of the Detroit Community Technology Project, and. We build um, wireless internet infrastructure and redistribute um, gigabit internet into communities that haven't had um, internet access before. Um, last year, um, well, we work with three organizations in Detroit to build neighborhood-governed internet service um, providers, what well, we call them ISPs. Um, so they're Grace in Action in Southwest Detroit, the North End Woodward Community Coalition, in the North End and Church of the Messiah um, in Island View on the east side of Detroit. Um, so far, we've connected 180 homes, so provided internet access for people who have had little to no access in the past. Um, we use digital stewards um, to build out the network infrastructure, and the stewards are residents of the communities that they work in. They are people of color, artists, educators and community organizers, um, and they range in age from elders to their teens. So one of the things that we think makes us different from a traditional ISP provider is that we practice data justice. Um, so I just wanna share with you some of the ways that we practice data justice on the EII networks. So one way is that we train our digital stewards as community technologists. And what that means, a community technologist is someone who uses and builds technology and integrates it into the community in a way that restores and heals um, relationships. And our stewards, um, the way that they avoid using and building harmful technologies um, is by regularly communicating with their neighborhood advisory councils, they host um, participatory design sessions um, in their communities, and they're also really intentional about how they go about expanding their networks. Another way is that we train the stewards in digital security, privacy, and consent. So last year, um, they went through a three-day intensive um, where they really learned how to think critically about data, privacy, um, <coughs> data, privacy, consent, safety versus security, and um, coming up with best practices um, to secure their networks. In turn, they host um, similar trainings for their communities, which can include anything from teaching someone how to secure their data to teaching them how to create um, a secure password. Um, they also practice consent um, within their teams. Another way is through our policies and how we share them with the people um, on our network. So we have a really robust privacy policy. It's about 12 pages long. Um, and that, those include um, how we practice um, net neutrality and consent on our network. So we're never going to sell or share a person's data. Um, we don't keep track of people's email addresses or other personal personally identifying numbers like your social security number, um, 
or your driver's license number. Um, it's written into the contracts that none of the network equipment is to be used um, for the purpose of surveillance. Um, yeah. Another way is through our principles. So the Equitable Internet Initiative has a set of principles that really guide um, how we work and collaborate with others, partners, and the communities. So there are a couple principles, but I just want to pull out um, a few as it relates to this topic. So the first one is long-term authentic relationships, right, which is the antithesis of surveillance. Um, because if we have a relationship that's rooted in trust and transparency, I'm less likely to view you as um, dangerous or um, a suspicious. Um, so we really focus on creating healthy interactions with the people that we work with, um, the people that we hire, and the people that we serve. Another um, principle is education. So that's because we really want to cultivate knowledge, and as it relates to this, um, we want to train our stewards, the people that we hire and work with, and those that we serve in digital security, privacy, and consent, and just using it as an opportunity um, to make them aware of the harmful technologies that are out there. And then finally is collaborative community ownership and governance. So this just really ensures that those that are the most affected um, by the issues of digital access are at the table and have a voice at the room, and that they're part of creating um, solutions to the challenges that they face. So our approach to safety is by not creating harmful technologies like facial recognition and other mass surveillance tools. Our approach is really community organizing, um, community engagement, um, relationship building, and building tools that allow for neighbors to communicate with each other safely. And we think that that's a really critical component in creating a healthy digital ecosystem. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of commonalities as well as some things that are even brand new to me. Um, but one common thread that I heard is, you know, the concept of, of language and what role your words play um, in uh, a government's ability to adopt a potentially harmful technology, um, one that's specifically harmful to specific communities. Um, so. You know, Marie, you mentioned um, some of the policies that came about following 9-11. Um, in the case of Detroit and facial recognition technology, um, this is a more recent um, contract that came about about two years ago. Um, and we weren't initially aware of, of the purchase of the technology. And as community became more and more informed about the contract itself, what it entailed, and how what the implications were, a lot of language kind of shifted in, dropped off. We had a really um, expansive uh, explanation from our government in terms of what was happening and why. So um, I'm curious if anyone has thoughts on you know, the, the role that narrative or language um, plays, not only in the realm of policy and how police are able to enact um, some of these really, really um, light touch um, policies, but also in terms of the communities themselves, how are we not aware of these things, or how are we aware but uh, somehow kind of missing what we really should be up and arms about in the street? So thanks for that question, Katie. Um, Detroit has um, suffered under the weight of about a half century of targeted propaganda assault. So across the world, for essentially 50 years, there's been one dominant negative narrative about the predominantly black city. And so when you have five decades worth of media, music, images, um, and narrative targeted at a particular environment, not only is it an external bias that is uh, perpetuated, but it's often internalized as well. And so 
a lot of times community members are convinced, even if they have not personally been exposed to harm, they are convinced to fear one another. Um, and so that has been a pretty much leveraged campaign against Detroit. Um, it is not to say that we are not, um, we don't have issues like any other major city, but particularly some of ours, our um, crimes can be attributed to quality of life crime, right? It's not to justify crime, but if you pull resources out of a community, there's no viable grocery stores, there are no um, public schools with adequate uh, technology and books and clean water. Uh, we have 52 schools right now where the, we just discovered six months ago that the water was poisoned with lead. So schools that have lead, poison water, or no water at all, um, you have different uh, neighborhoods that are being blighted um, and disinvested in. Oh, I should, let me, let me reframe that. Invested in with surveillance policing and those types of things, but not invested in with resources and infrastructure. And so this has been um, leveraged across the world until about maybe five years ago. Any time that I would leave the state or the country, people would ask me very targeted questions about Detroit. Like, do you have to run in the house? Are you afraid for your life? Have you ever been shot? And, and like, these are the types of questions that people would ask you and really seriously, honestly mean it when they ask you that. And just only five, about five years ago, the question shifted from, oh, aren't you happy it's coming back? Aren't you really happy about all the stuff that's happening in Detroit? Which totally marginalizes and visibilizes all the people who have been viable, contributory human beings within the city for those 50 years that everyone was demonizing. And so I say all that to say, when you have demonized the city, it makes the state, it makes the world have little interest in protecting that city. It lets everyone buy into surveillance, militarization, and policing as a way to kind of control that problematic demographic that the world has been convinced to fear. And so that is why things like Project Greenlight can come in and within two years go from nine surveillance cameras with flashing green lights to 570 surveillance cameras with very little hoopla um, from anyone to defend our honor. And so um, I just want folks to think about that. What you've thought about Detroit, like for the entire time that you've been alive, and what you might think about Detroit now and why you think the things you think about Detroit. I would, I would add two things too, <laughs> because your question was about how language um, affects how we think about security. And for me, two things come to mind. One is when I introduce this term of the dangerous individual in the beginning, I think this is really, like you said, Tawana, it's really a term that creates a binary between those who are going to be protected by the state and those who are demonized for being potentially dangerous and therefore not worth protection, but on the opposite, like being the ones um, yeah, who need to be surveyed or who need to be deported or whatever the measure is. Um, and I think one thing that um, I, that is also part of my work and that I find really important is because this uh, concept or the idea of the dangerous individual really relies on it being really abstract. It needs to be an abstract idea of a person who is demonized for it to work. And then if you bring light to it and if you show the individuals who are actually, um, who are the ones who are affected by this, um, I think it really helps to bring to bring more light to the discussion and to make it a lot harder or people find it a lot harder when they actually see who are the individuals behind this term to still uphold this image they created or the public or the that was created in the debate initially and then another thing i find really important and that also comes to my mind when i think about language is what we do as at this organization I work at, is also, I mean, we are journalists, we are creating narratives. <laughs> and then one, um, one nar narrative that we have been following or that we kind of like intentionally also put up is to um, 
to not only talk about national security, but also talk about IT security, because this has been a large discussion in Germany, because often when they, um, or when new policies are justified with, um, with talking about national security and the new need for surveillance because of national security, it is often not, um, not considered what this means, or like, um, Syrian's technology, especially spyware, means for IT security. So it really helped us to bring IT security as a like desirable result also to the front to um, to kind of like counterbalance this narrative on national security. So when you talk about language, there's there's part of the problem, particularly here in Detroit, uh, involves language, and there's a word that we haven't used here that's really uh, pertinent, and it's a lie, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm, it's, th there's no two ways about it. A lot of what has happened here has proceeded as it has simply because people in charge have lied, right? Not withheld the truth, not prevaricated, not, no, they have lied. They have made deliberate misrepresentations of knowable material facts, right? Our, chief of police in particular. So um, you can't separate, you can't talk about language until you t without talking about holding the people who misuse language accountable. And we've done a really bad job of that. But uh, it's, that, that's something that, that has to be done. I mean, the chief of police, uh, anyone who has gone out there and said, for example, Project Greenlight is reducing crime, and you, you hear that all the time, and then when you challenge them to prove that, they'll say, well, reducing crime wasn't the intent of Project Greenlight, even though that's the only criteria they've ever used for evaluating it. Uh, but when you challenge them to prove it, they go, well, no, it wasn't meant to do that, but won't tell you what it was, in fact, meant to do. At a certain point, this, is, um, this goes to uh, recognizing <laughs> Language reveals a lot, and when people misuse language, when they are lying, then they are liars and, <laughs> and uh, unworthy of the trust, uh, the public trust that they've been given. So I think we have to make sure we don't lose sight of how language can get misused. So I'll just add that the three neighborhoods that we work in, um, we've also expanded to Highland Park, so four. Um, neighborhoods, but they're um, majority, majority black, um, with the exception of Southwest, which has a really large um, population of immigrants. But these are communities, like Tawana mentioned, that have traditionally suffered from um, disinvestment. I mean, you only need to drive through these neighborhoods and to see the flashing green lights to see how um, unsafe they're actually considered. Um, but one of the good things about EII and another one of our principles is storytelling. Um, so this program really gives um, people on the networks and people within those communities to really share um, the stories that are important to them and to really counter some of the narratives that are out there um, about their communities. So for example, like as a child, I was always told um, the East Side was really dangerous. Um, so now Church of the Messiah has an opportunity um, with the EII networks to share different narratives. Like one of them being like how they have one of the largest populations of senior citizens and some of the other great work that that church is doing within their communities. Um, in Southwest to counter some of the narratives, um, some of the stories that they're putting out are how they're creating um, applications to track um, air pollution and air emissions um, because there are a lot of refineries in that community that cause um, some of the highest rates of asthma um, in, the in the country and other um, respiratory um, illnesses. And so one of the really important components of EII is storytelling, is really creating those opportunities for people to share their own narratives um, and really just the great work that they're doing. So I got a little hung up on, on the, the word lies. Um, and more importantly, let's say, uh, what stuff was accountability. And I'm wondering, you know, Eric, I know, um, it, you know you're kind of our legal perspective here. And I'm hoping you can shed some light on how you discovered said lies. 
outside of just listening week after week and seeing how it changed, um, but in terms of maybe pouring over um, contracts and other things like that. Um, and Marie, certainly weigh in as well. As a journalist, I'm sure you have some ways and means. I would just love to hear, you know, what we're doing to better understand what they're saying versus what the realities are for our community. Well, so, <laughs> So there, there are two things that there are two things that have kind of made me really aware of the disconnect between what uh, what our chief of police and mayor have said and the reality, right? And so the first is I go to meetings, okay? And public meetings are a wonderful thing, but most of the public works, and you know they don't have the time to go to these meetings that frequently drone on endlessly. Um, so, so going to those meetings gives me the access that anybody would have, but it's my job, right? So I get to go do it and, and see it. So that's one part. Uh, the other part, of course, is the Freedom of Information Act. And it's amazing what you can get when you ask the right question. Uh, so for example, on facial recognition, I, act, I actually filed a FOIA request um, I don't know, this is in, uh, it's over two years ago. And I asked, were there any contracts for this kind of thing? And they said, no, right? And later on, it comes out that at the time they responded, there actually was a contract that had in fact been signed by the other side and had been signed by corporate counsel in Detroit showing it was approved as to form but it had not been formally signed off yet on by city council, so it didn't turn up in my request, right? Um, yeah, so, but you have to be willing, you have to go out of your way to ask questions, ask questions again. Um, perfect example is we don't know how often um, Detroit Police Department has used facial recognition technology we don't know how often they've used it or how they've used it over the last two years because there have been no policies in place governing it. So we filed a FOIA request to actually find out that kind of information. Uh, you have to ask the question though and asking the question sometimes means recognizing you cannot take what was said initially at face value because otherwise you wouldn't be asking the question, right? I would directly add to what Eric just said, because you talked about Freedom of Information Act. I'm not familiar with the American laws, but um, we definitely do have the same in Germany also. We do have freedom of information laws, and there's been a lot of challenge from like um, civil rights organizations to take those laws even further and turn them into transparency laws. So we want, or there's like currently a fight going on for not only uh, being able to ask for information from official agencies, but then like pre like uh, proactively publishing this information. So for me, next level would be not needing someone like you, Eric, <laughs> going there and asking for this information, but then like just publishing it because it is in public interest and it is, I guess, financed by the public. So it should just be. There is no need to keep most things secret or like every like whenever there's a taking um, there's an evaluation process taking place I think those information should just be published because this is in the interest of all to know about um, and then also like for myself obviously I think it is super important to have independent media and people like you or like independent organizations civil rights organizations who have the capacities and the resources to to do this work to go and ask the questions and follow up like because a lot of the work we are doing is to actually um, keep track of where a law is or how when it was implemented and when it was first used and sometimes those processes take years months It's like really long-term processes that you have to keep the dates and keep track on where it's at and you cannot rely on Like just private like individuals to take on that work, but you really need the resources to be able to do this um, and then maybe a last last point to that question um, I think another discussion, I just read the news this morning on uh, President Trump and the leak that was, <laughs> um, there was a whistleblower. whistleblower. Yeah, and leak. I think like protection for whistleblowers is also really important. It's not, I mean, for Syrians' laws, it's not always 
um, yeah, but I mean, we really need people from the inside uh, to be able to go out and step up and um, publish information. Because I think one of the most important um, pushes we had in the last year is what Edward Snowden and the documents he leaked, those were super important from, for the discussion and where it's at right now on state surveillance. So just as a quick sort of information, point of information, <laughs> so the Freedom of Information Act, and there's a federal one and most states have an equivalent, requires the federal government, uh, requires the government, whatever body, government body, to turn over um, public records, so records of public bodies. Uh, so the city council and the chief and the board of police commissioners fall into that category. Uh, there's actually a, an ordinance being proposed that would proactively, as you say, require the police to submit uh, a report of how surveillance is being used, um, how it being used by the Detroit Police Department. Interestingly enough, the ACLU has proposed something called CCOPS, Civilian Control Over Police Surveillance. Uh, the city of Detroit is has civilian input into police surveillance. So it leaves out the part where there's specific penalties and it leaves out um, you know, a, a, commu a, a community oversight board. So a lot of that is actually left out of the proposed Detroit ordinance. Um, but it all comes down to creating the kind of transparency that you're talking about. Because without it, the average person just doesn't have the time to keep track of everything. And I also um, just want to chime in and say there's 2,600 open data portals across the, the world, um, U.S. mostly, but a lot outside of the U.S. And these portals, um, so Detroit Community Technology Project created a, pro a report called A Critical Summary of Detroit's Project Greenlight in its greater context. And we pulled a lot of data from the actual open data portal that the city government put online. Now, a lot of push from Detroit Digital Justice Coalition and others went to getting some of that data on these open data portals, and I would encourage folks wherever you live to push for your city government, like Marie said, to put this stuff out there because it should be accessible to you. But we were able to pull police response times. We were able to pull where the Project Greenlight locations were and different things. We were able to pull maps from this site. And so these are these open data portals, if you look where you live, I'm almost 99% sure that you all have one. But there is little transparency about them existing, and there's little transparency about what information you can get on those portals, but you can hold your city government accountable to making that information accessible to you. So we do have some time left. Um, if any in the audience would like to ask some questions, please raise your hand. So thank you all for your presentations and for hosting this talk. It's really great to hear from everybody on the panel. Um, I have a question about the role that private capital and development plays in the ways that these technologies are financed and sort of, I think I'm kind of speculating on the ways in which um, being able to kind of beta test some of these facial recognition technologies in a city like Detroit where perhaps the appearance is that there will be little pushback or that they will be able to sort of get away with doing whatever they want to and that then perhaps these technologies will then be deployed in many other places. I'm wondering if that sort of speculation on my part, if you're thinking that that's what's happening and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on just sort of the rampant development of new technologies by people who are looking to make money without really any sense that um, that these need to be checked or that uh, you know our civil rights are, are being infringed upon in the name of just making more money? Okay, so, so, so yes, your instincts are right. Um, if, you're, if you're not from Detroit, um, there was an instance maybe two years ago when two young ladies decided to put some graffiti on the side of a building here in Detroit and our local billionaire, Dan Gilbert, 
actually used security cameras to take their picture, circulated among all his employees, and the young ladies were actually found, um, which is kind of a weird use of private sector surveillance, right? Um, and all of this is com all of this is reflective of the fact that surveillance in Detroit is not purely a public sector endeavor. If you go into you know the Cube with, uh, downtown, there's a huge surveillance center down there, which is as, which is as, as extensive as anything the public sector has put together. It is you are right in that it will probably be the private sector that leads the way on developing and initially implementing these technologies. Where I have some hope is that despite what we may think, there are actually people behind corporations so uh, who are capable of just doing the right thing every once in a while. So for example, uh, the maker of the largest um, mobile camera that's used for police surveillance actually came out and said, don't put facial recognition technology in our cameras, it would be immoral, the technology is not mature enough. So it is entirely possible for the private sector to do the right thing. Uh, it, ultimately, it's whether or not consumers are going to be willing to hold them accountable. Um, but yeah, you're exactly right. That is where the lead, I think, is going to be taken. And if you look at the way the private sector has played out in so many other areas of our life, it is the kind of thing to make you feel a little scared. And, and, and facial recognition is projected to be $11.5 billion market by 2024, uh, $9.5 billion by 2022. Um, and that is at the rate that it's going now. Now, w it's been further exas I mean, between last year and this year, it's ramped up tremendously. And so I would argue that those market projections are way off base, that it'll be worth even more by the time we get to 2022. Um, we're looking at schools, we're looking at public housing, we're looking at uh, nursing centers, we're looking at gas stations. And then if you add Ring into the equation, which was formerly Amazon, and private citizens' doorbells that uh, have that component that they can add, that technology, and have that system bypass uh, a warrant and allow police automatic access to your surveillance cameras under the guise of safety. That's a whole nother mechanism where you have departments, police departments all over the U.S. giving away these ring doorbells to make community members feel safer so that they can then just swoop in and have your surveillance without having to go through the court system. And so there are some cities that are fighting it, but um, it's moving so rapidly. And unfortunately, we have Amazon, uh, the richest man in the world, advocating for putting his own policies in place to govern facial recognition. And so you have, like Eric said, sometimes you'll have people that will come out and they'll, they'll be on the right side of history. But in most cases, you look at Facebook, you look at Amazon, you look at these corporations and tech companies, they want to write the own, their own policies policies to regulate themselves and our legislators have not had any teeth in really like stopping them from having the control that they have. Um, ad additionally in Detroit, it's about $6,000 per green light location. So we're looking at the city already making over $3 million um, in just the last couple of years on this technology. And so money is driving um, this. It's, a, it's kind of like a pay for policing, unfortunately, because green light locations are priority one. If you have a green light, you're prioritized. Your location is prioritized. And so even though you have gas station owners and business owners who rather not opt into this system, they want to feel protected. Um, and so they're being forced to choose between opting into a system that they might not agree with and keeping their establishment, quote unquote, safe. And so there is, it's, it's very complicated. Um, and I'll just say this finally, you've had some business owners, once they learned about facial recognition being a component, especially, um, uh, um, Arab business owners who were saying like, wait a minute, I know that I have undocumented members that uh, come into my 
um, gas station or my business. I don't want facial recognition as a component, but because of lies, um, they're being convinced that there are separate systems and only under dire circumstances would that ever be the case, and then the fears are quelled. Um, and so, yeah, your, as you said, your, your hesitation and your predictions are pretty much on point with what's actually happening here and globally. And we are, this is the first example of this private public partnership that got community buy-in um, into this surveillance and it's being replicated rapidly. There's already Highland Park um, in, in Michigan and eCourse Michigan and it's being touted as a model for other places. Sorry, y'all, I lost my voice yesterday, so I'm gonna take it easy. Um, I definitely, I'm so glad you mentioned Highland Park because um, I think one of the intersections um, that I see a lot is uh, also how surveillance affects Muslim communities as it relates to CVE, right? Countering violent extremism and how those are, you know, going hand in hand and coming up on the 10 year anniversary of Imam Luqman being shot. I don't know how many of y'all know about that. Um, it, this is a very sore topic for us that live, uh, for Muslims that live in the city. Um, and uh, Highland Park has one of the biggest populations of black Muslims in this area. And so when uh, I think it's been like something that hasn't come up a lot in the conversations and it's just like, we're already being surveilled and you know, y'all keep, you throw this in and it makes it even worse. Um, and, uh, but my question for y'all was, and I'm sorry, I came in a little late, so if you mentioned this before, is as a community organizer, one of the things that I'm butting up against the most is fear in our communities, especially from our older residents, right? And it's like, I can't discount that because I get it, you know, you've gone through a lot. But at the same time, this is terrible. And as of yet, I still haven't had a, and you know what I'm saying, and we also have in our communities, uh, like in our black communities, in our communities, there's a really big, there's a hierarchy of how you speak to elders. There's a sp specific way, you know, there's a respect thing. Um, and, and navigating that and also like being respectfully saying no, that this is like terrible is so hard. And I don't know if y'all have anything um, to speak to that about. I'll be really brief and pass the mic, but history is so important. I would always pull like examples of history. I'll use um, Project Greenlight as an example. I'm always tying it back to the lantern laws of the 1800s where if you were black, you were forced to carry a lantern in front of your face if you weren't in the presence of a white person. And so like if you can tie, or, or Tuskegee experiment where biometrics were used and leveraged against black people. Um, there are so many examples. If you look at the hyper surveillance post 9-11, there are so many historical examples of how fear mongering was utilized to further surveil, incarcerate, and harm communities of color. And I think that the more, and there are many, many, many other examples, and I'm happy to connect you with a whole slew of those but yeah you're right respectfully in talking to our elders I mean that is why police targeted our senior citizen population to get community buy-in because they knew that this was the most vulnerable population that they are sitting in front of the television being inundated inundated with images of crime nonstop. And so they knew that that would be their biggest voice, but we can remind them nostalgically of when the neighborhoods were more viable, when they had more investment in community and how we kept each other safe and how you as a younger generation would like to um, coexist with them in a way that brings back that aspect of how we um, built relationships like Janice was saying. But there are many examples of how this is not the solution and it has not worked. Yeah. All right, we got time for two more questions. I'm gonna take my hands right here. Thank you. Uh, my question is about pushback against uh, uh, facial recognition. I've seen a lot of technologies, um, simple technologies, uh, including makeup. I've seen technologies including um, even like glasses that sort of obscure or uh, disallow facial recognition technology from being able to work. Um, 
Can you all speak to uh, maybe widespread adoption, what that might look like, how we might inform our communities of ways to sort of push back if we can't stop the proliferation of things like Project Greenlight, what other things might we do collectively? How might we collaborate with one, one another to, uh, to keep, keep it from working? All right, so as an initial rule, I'm, I'm kind of hesitant to promote uh, a specific strategy to push back, simply because technology changes and circumstances change so quickly, almost any approach that's ado adopted is literally going to be, you know, there's gonna be a counter move shortly thereafter. Um, and so you talk about the, you talk about the way th facial, facial recognition gets built into everything we do, right? So it's gone from needing your thumbprint to get into your phone to suddenly, uh, you know, you don't even have that option on the newer phones, right? They've completely taken that away. You have to basically use a code or your face to get into your phone, um, which is interesting because the police can't make you give up a code, but they can kind of make you look at something. Anyway, uh, so the point isn't how you push back, but the point is that you push back. There's not going to be any single strategy. Um, but if you start talking about things like wearing glasses or a mask or anything else, I guarantee you won't be long bef before what you get is legislation saying these kind of, you know, this is illegal. You can't do that. You can't wear this in public. Sort of like this, the same approach to, you know, license plate uh, readers, right? I mean, it didn't take long before in most states having anything that prevents your license plate from being captured by a camera is illegal. Uh, so it's... it's Fighting back against the technology itself, it's all, that's going to be always be a running battle. It has to be a, a fight against what's behind it and what's putting it in place. All right. Yeah, uh, because you also ask how to obscure uh, facial recognition technology, I would add to that that I think it's already the technology is always moving already moving towards. Uh, recognizing behavior rather than just faces. So people will be in future like cameras could recognize people just by the way you walk so really just covering up faces isn't isn't like eric said isn't going to last long as a way to <laughs> obscure that technology but i think this question also is really linked to the question we had earlier about like how private companies or what role private enterprises play in this whole process because i think a large part of how the technology is developing is that private enterprises get the chance to train the, their technology with real-time data. That's like one large, I think also in the US, one really large phenomenon that we have, and that really needs to be questioned, like enterprises walking up to state agencies and offering their technology for almost free just so they can train their data. And I think the value of the data, real, like life or real-time data to this technology is really underestimated often. Oh, so Eric, one of the last things you said was who's taking a look at who's behind it and I think what they're getting from it. And so like one of the benefits of surveillance is that it keeps people separated and it keeps those in power in power and it helps them to amass more wealth. So I think that one of the ways um, to push back is to do the exact opposite of what they don't want us to do. Like Tawana mentioned the ring doorbells earlier. That's just another method for them to keep us watching each other. And so if we do the opposite, if we work on building those relationships with each other, um, work on being transparent and how we're communicating and what we're doing, then we work to break down some of those barriers that lead and feed into surveillance. Just a quick question. I believe this was maybe already discussed between some of you, um, but from just a pessimistic side view, I, I think we're, um, I'm over here, hey. Um, <laughs> I think we're headed in a situation where surveillance is, is, is going to be the prototype of every uh, metropolitan city, uh, you know, looking at New York and places like London where there's, you can see the whole city, uh, even starting with our phones from the, the marketing standpoint to children where it's cool and for people of our generation is convenient and older, you need it, you know. 
um, from a fear aspect. So you want to see the people around you because you know you aren't um, physically able to protect yourself. So that being said, um, that we are headed uh, in a world where this is just going to be a part of the culture. Um, how do we, uh, again, I just, you know, maybe discreet ways, how do we combat that? Because I don't see stopping it is going to be quite feasible. Not that it can't happen, but I'm just saying, looking at the course of where we're going right now, and Apple sales and Amazon seems to be going quite well with their, Amazon and particularly uh, military contracts, uh, and, and yet us have prime uh, memberships. Um, so how do we as informed citizenry and, and those who aren't have a better understanding of how to navigate the internet of things? I'll just say really quickly, we have to resist. Um, there was a time when slavery was well accepted and it existed. And so, and I'm sure that felt overwhelming <laughs> to people who were enslaved. So there, but there is a, there is a light at the end of the tunnel that if you look up, there's legislation being offered all across the United States and outside of the United States. The fact that we have someone here from Germany who is resisting, like all across the world, there are people who don't believe that this is the world that we deserve. And so we have to push back on every level. We can't afford to move into a social credit system. If you have looked at China's surveillance system on any level, it's literally like being real time uh, trapped into open air prison essentially because you can't travel to places, you can't stay in certain hotels, you can't um, live in certain neighborhoods and that already happens to marginalized communities but imagine not even having to apply for something before being rejected. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that yes, it's overwhelming. And yes, in some places it's moving really, really fast. But I really do have faith that there is more of us than there are of them and that we can flip this thing on its head. It's already happening. So um, yeah, let me let Eric get in real quick. But I'm just saying like there is legislation. There's a lot of stuff happening that is pushing back. We have it in Michigan, several bills that we're pushing for. And then we have the alternatives that Janice talked about. And so just keep the faith. Please keep the faith and just keep pushing. All right. So I'm not as optimistic as she is. I believe in fighting. I believe that ultimately we will lose on that. But I think we won't lose the entire game because there is one way to turn this back. Uh, and this sounds really horrible, but there has to be something really, really bad that happens from it, right? So, I mean, the thing, the thing about it is you lose a password, right? You can change your password. You can't change what your face looks like. That's the problem with biometric security. Once it's been compromised, it has been compromised. So we need for the only way that this will change or there will be real pushback is if a database of biometric information is completely compromised and millions of people suffer. I mean, I know that sounds horrible. I mean, but, I mean, but seriously, like an, on an ongoing basis where your face eventually has become sort of like your key code through life or your retina or whatever, and suddenly it is compromised and people are out there duplicating your face. You can't change your face. They're duplicating your face and it is being used in that manner once that happens, then I think people will, I think at that point, there'll be some, they'll, people will pump the brakes. Uh, but I think it's gonna take something at that level for people to start pumping the brakes on this. I think that may be our time for today on that note. Um, so thank you all for being here again. And just uh, closing out from your moderator here, um, I think, to all of these questions, really, uh, one potential answer is to stay engaged, um, be it research, be it just talking with your neighbors, ensuring that the person next to you knows that these issues are going to impact them if they're not aware of that already. Um, so feel free, like I said, check out everyone's uh, speaker profiles on the site, see what kinds of um, information you can find, pick up some new, some new uh, newsletters and publications to follow, Miss um, Politique. Uh, you can translate that, you know, pretty easily. So um, I think from here we're going to head outside, maybe grab some coffees or something to eat. So if you didn't get a chance to ask a question, um, if they're not open to try and answer it, <laughs> thank you for being here. All right, let's give a round of applause for everybody one more time.
Thanks for going out. God bless you. Good night.